Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to St. Mary's and welcome to everyone who's joining us from home. It's good to be together this sunny morning. Uh, a few uh, notices as we begin. Uh, firstly, just to make sure that you all have in your diaries our APCM, our annual church meeting, uh, will be on the 7th of October at 7.45 p.m. Um, and please do uh, either email or phone the church office uh, if you are planning to attend, um, just so we can make sure we've got space for everyone. So that would be really helpful. Uh, we will also be having our harvest collection on the 4th of October. Um, given the current uh, conditions that we are all living in, and this is going to be a, a financial collection only. We just wanted to let you know that. Um, and the, all donations will be split between Millgrove and Food Bank, Epping Forest Food Bank. So that will be uh, Sunday the 4th of October. And then finally, our hungry prayer night in a, a change to the originally published details, uh, our hungry prayer night on Friday the 2nd of October. It will now be online. Um, so just to let you know that. Um, but please do still speak to the church office if you would like to be a part of that evening. And then finally, before we uh, begin our service, uh, we just, we wanted to flag up really, uh, you will, I'm sure, all have heard the, um, the change in the, in the guidance that's come out over the last week. And we're now operating with this rule of six. Um, and we, we just wanted to flag up really, as we leave, um, obviously we, we are then, once we're outside of the church, we are back under the rule of six, uh, I'm afraid. So um, we're obviously in a very public position so we don't we're not trying to instill fear in anyone but we just wanted to remind everyone kindly um, about that um, so as we leave please just be mindful of people's need for for space and also just to small groups of six we can have a, a chat after the service and that will be wonderful thank you so let's take a moment of quiet uh, before we begin our service and then we will start in our uh, with our service sheets So, Heavenly Father, we have gathered today, both physically here and online, to worship your name, to re-center ourselves upon your presence, your mercy, your grace, and your love. Fill us afresh with your Holy Spirit, we pray. Reignite in us the flame of faith. Help us to live as people of hope in the midst of your hurting world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So can I invite you all to stand as we begin? So grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you and also with you. We pray together. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, the first commandment is this, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is the only Lord. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Amen. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Please take a seat. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, Jesus Christ, to save us from our sins, to be our advocate in heaven, and to bring us to eternal life. So Jesus says, repent, 
for the kingdom of heaven is close at hand. So let us turn away from our sin and turn to Christ, confessing our sins in penitence and faith. Lord God, we have sinned against you. We have done evil in your sight. We are sorry and repent. Have mercy on us according to your love. Wash away our wrongdoing and cleanse us from our sin. Renew a right spirit within us and restore us to the joy of your salvation. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And may the Father of all mercies cleanse us from our sins and restore us in his image to the praise and glory of his name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let's join together in saying the words of the Gloria. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. One of the church's prayers. Merciful God, your Son came to save us and bore our sins on the cross. May we trust in your mercy and know your love, rejoicing in the righteousness that is ours through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Uh, Graham and Myra are going to bring our readings to us and uh, then we will join together in the words of the Creed. The epistle is taken from Acts chapter 13, verses 1 to 5. Barnabas and Saul sent off. Now in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers. Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaen, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshipping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. The two of them, sent on their way by the Holy Spirit, went down to Seleucia, and sailed from there to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish synagogues. John was with them as a helper. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Gospel is taken from Matthew, chapter 20, verses 1 to 16. The parable of the workers in the vineyard. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them into his vineyard. 
about nine in the morning, he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go and work in my vineyard and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again about noon and about three in the afternoon and did the same thing. About five in the afternoon, he went out and found still others standing around. <coughs> he asked them, why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. He said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. The workers who were hired about five in the afternoon came and each received a denarius. So when those came who were hired first, they expected to receive more but each of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. These who were hired last worked only one hour, they said, and you've made them equal to us, who've borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them, I'm not being unfair to you, friend, didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the one who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have a right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I'm generous? So the last will be first and the first will be last. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to thee, O Christ. So as we remain standing, let's uh, say together the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Amen. Please do take a seat and Brenda is going to bring the word to us for today. Shall we start with prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the example of the church at Antioch. 
And I pray, Father, that as we study that church, that you, through your Holy Spirit, will show us how we should be. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I think as everybody is aware, we're living through times of great change. I'm in my 60s, and I've never known such a change in my ordinary everyday life before. There's been much sadness, hasn't there, as well as many situations to which we need to adjust and keep on adjusting because things keep changing. We would never have dreamed a year ago that we would be sitting in church wearing face masks, not being allowed to sing or even sit close to one one another, and there would be no coffee after church. These are unprecedented times. Words and phrases such as social distancing and shielding have acquired a very specific meaning. Until recently, I thought to zoom meant to move quickly or suddenly with a loud humming or buzzing sound. Even I've had to learn that it can mean something different. (laughs) The COVID epidemic has presented many challenges. But what I think has been good about it is it's given us time to reflect and review and to think about how we should be living as Christians and how we should be doing church. This is not to say that we aren't already doing lots of things well, but it's a good time to reflect, isn't it? And I think to look at the example of the Antioch church is a good way of doing that. We have no records of Paul writing to the Christian church there, although he may well have done. We know that he was based there when he kind of went out on his missionary journeys. We don't have a great deal of information about it, but I think what we do know is helpful. We do know that Antioch was a a really large city and that it was probably the third largest city in the Roman Empire. It was very important because people wanted to move there and it was also a thriving trade centre through which many people passed. It was also known, like a lot of cities in the Roman Empire, for its moral degradation. No surprise there, I guess, is it? (laughs) There was also a church there. And the church in Antioch really started to grow after Stephen was stoned in Jerusalem and the persecution of the Jewish Christians started in earnest. This meant that many Christians left, fled, should I say, from Jerusalem and travelled all over the place, as far away as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and as we've got in today's reading, Antioch. And the interesting thing is that wherever the Christians travelled, they told others about the Lord. They were keen to evangelise, in spite of the fact that it was so difficult. And some of them would become Christians themselves. Now, the Jewish Christians who first fled to Antioch spoke, first of all, to the Jewish people. But very soon, they started speaking to Gentiles as well. This was a very mixed city. So the Antiochian church was made up of a large number of Jewish and non-Jewish or Gentile Christians. And I suppose the first thing that struck me about this passage is that even though they were in great adversity, even though there was persecution, God was still on the job. And God is always on the job. We shouldn't be surprised about that, should we? Because Paul told told the Romans, in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Now, I know we're not persecuted, or should I say not yet, but we are living through an epidemic. And one of the comforts I have living through this epidemic is that I know that God is on the job, that he's still working his purposes out, and he's working his purposes out in us as individuals, in the church and in the world, no matter what we, what we see happening. 
So God hasn't gone on holiday, and neither should we. (laughs) So let us look more closely at the church in Antioch. It was in North Syria in biblical times, and today within Turkey's borders. Turkey is now a country that has, where Christians have a lot of difficulties. And I often read information from um, organisations like Open Doors, Release, and the Barnabas Fund, and they tell us that we should be praying for Christians in Turkey. They again are having a hard time, and there's great pressure on them great pressure on them, particularly if they were once Muslim, to actually renounce their faith. So just a reminder, let's kind of pray for Christians in Turkey and all the many other places where Christians are persecuted. I've already said that Antioch was a mixed, multicultural church. And we can really see that when we look at the list of prophets and teachers in the first verse of this chapter. They were probably also the leaders of the church, I would guess. There was Barnabas, who we know was a Levite from Cyprus. There was Simeon called Niger, probably called that, commentators note, because of his skin colour. There was Lucius of Cyrene, Cyrene being in Libya, in Africa. There was Manon, who was of high birth, and had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch. And then there was Saul, later called Paul, from Tarsus in Syria, a Roman citizen who had received rabbinical training. And we can see by this very diverse list of people that the church did not discriminate against different groups of people. And what it would seem when we look at the church of Antioch was that everyone was encouraged to use the gifts they were given by the Holy Spirit, regardless of anything else. That's not surprising. And it's not surprising that the church is is most effective when this happens. Paul says in his letter to the Corinthians in chapter 12, now to each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. We work effectively as a church when we're all using the gifts that God has given us. So it's important for all of us, isn't it, to not make judgments about people and what they can and can't do on the basis of any other reason, i.e. skin colour, gender, age, class, accent, education, or any other reason, other than encouraging people to use the gifts given them by the Holy Spirit. And I don't think any of us would do that consciously, but I think sometimes it's possible to do that unconsciously. And I think it's worthwhile, every now and again, asking the Lord to show us, asking the Lord to show us whether we're, our judgments of people, are unfair in any way because because of unfair reasons. I think we also do well to encourage others in discovering their gifts because the other thing that I've realised about people's gifts is that some people are more confident than others. I, took, I take part in a Zoom Bible study um, once a week and there are people there, not only from this country but all over the world. There's a, a couple of people from the Philippines and there's somebody Zooming in from Nigeria. And we were asked what we thought the gifts were that the Holy Spirit had given us. And there was only seven people there. And there were three people. And they they weren't young people. There were three people who didn't know. And that really made me think that um, part of our job, as well as using the gift that God has given us, is to encourage other people to see what their gifts are. And when we're all using the gifts that God gives us, We are a fully functional, effective church. So Antioch was a diverse church. They were also clearly a missional church, even though the situation was difficult. They sent people out from the church to spread the gospel to other places, and they were keen to evangelize. Verse 2 tells us that while 
while they were worshipping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I've called them. These words prompted Paul and Barnabas to embark on their first missionary journey. And we know that certainly wasn't the last missionary journey. Um, Paul had a few missionary journeys. And where they went to on that first one was first of all to go to Cyprus and then on to Asia Minor, present-day Turkey. Now, they had a hard time of it even then, Paul and Barnabas. They encountered fierce verbal opposition and they even encountered stoning. But they weren't deterred. They were determined that as Christians with this kind of wonderful, wonderful news of who Jesus is, that they were going to tell other people about it. And Paul, as you know, never stopped preaching the gospel, even when he was in Roman prison. If you read, I think it is in Romans, if you read in Romans, it's clear that some of the guards that he was chained to became Christians. That's how keen Paul was to evangelise. And we should be that keen too, we're a church that, that does a lot of mission, and that's, that's really great. And there's ways in which all of us can still, in these times of COVID, tell other people about the Lord. We may not be called to do the journeys that Paul and Barnabas did, although we should never rule out that possibility. Philippe, for example, regularly travels to Brazil, Spain, I think Greece, with a team. So we may be called to do those long journeys, but even if we're not, we're called to tell other people the gospel. Jesus gave this instruction to his disciples and therefore to us just before he ascended into heaven. And it's recorded at the end of Mark's gospel. He said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation just want to give a couple of examples of the way St Mary's has done that or is likely to do that in the future. There are others, many others. We remember that um, Lydia and Mark, who went to St Michael's nearby, took a few people with them from our congregation. And that was express intention of helping the people there to spread the gospel more widely in the local area. That's happened with Mark and Lydia, and that's likely to happen again. And maybe, maybe the Lord will call one of us here to do something about that. We also have plans to start a new service at four o'clock, to which some members of the congregation will transfer their attendance. That was going to start in May. Clearly it couldn't, but it will start later. And the idea was that hopefully they would bring others along who at the moment don't go to church at all. And particularly that time in a four o'clock for families can be better. So that's another way to think about doing mission. And we heard last week, didn't we, from Sue and Charlie, I think they're over there, that even the need to social distance while it makes evangelism more difficult, doesn't make it impossible. I find that when I start praying for friends and family to, take, to come to know the Lord and ask the Lord to give me opportunities to talk to them about it, that actually I get those opportunities. That amazes me, really, although it definitely shouldn't. <laughs> It does amaze me that I pray and I get an answer. But I often find that I do get opportunities to talk to people about the Lord. I don't necessarily come out with the the full gospel, although sometimes I have, when people have asked me how I became a Christian. But at the very least, I find I get the opportunity to talk about some kind of church-related activity or or say something about God helping me. And I think it's really important that we pray for those opportunities. When Sue, and Char- when Sue was talking last week, she mentioned about talking 
about looking for the people of peace. And when we had John McGinley here, um, can't remember when it was now, but still, <laughs> um, he, um, he spoke about, <coughs> about the people of peace and how Jesus did when he told the 72 disciples to go and proclaim the kingdom of God. That set me thinking to pray specifically for the people of peace. It doesn't mean to say I don't pray for other people, but to think particularly of praying for people of integrity, of compassion, and who are keen on justice. And I find that those people, even though they may not agree with me at all about being a Christian, that they usually give me a, f a fair hearing. And sometimes people are happy for us to pray for them. So what I'm saying really is that, um, and it's a challenge for me as well, is that even though we're social distancing, even though we're not able to engage in the social activities we had been in the past, that the Lord will provide us with opportunities to evangelise, to be missional. After all, most of us wouldn't be here unless somebody had taken that opportunity with us. <laughs> That's certainly the case for me. I also want to say that the church at Antioch was a place where people were deeply committed to God. They were using the gifts the Holy Spirit had given them, and we're told in this very short text that they worshipped, prayed, and fasted. And from the importance, given, the importance given to teachers, I inferred, I inferred they study scripture. Verses 2 and 4 talk about the church heeding the direction of the Holy Spirit. I, I want to be somebody that heeds the direction of the Holy Spirit. And I know that I'm more likely to hear the Holy Spirit and more likely to obey him when I hear him if I'm habitually seeking God and drawing close to him. The Antioch Church were doing that, and I'm interested to see the list of spiritual disciplines that they give, because it includes fasting. Um, fasting is something I've never spoken about, and fasting is something that I haven't really done for a very, very long time. And it just made me think, should I think about fasting again? In the long distant past, I have fasted. I fasted near Easter to help me kind of remember the Easter story and what Jesus went through on the, on the cross. What I can remember, and I didn't do a deep fast, what I can remember was that the hunger pangs of missing a couple of meals reminded me that more important than food for my stomach was spiritual food. And I can also remember that I felt spiritually refreshed. And I think maybe I should consider doing it again. Now the question is, should we fast as a church? I'm going to leave that to the clergy to think about. <laughs> Hugh laughs. <laughs> You're sitting at the front. <laughs> okay, the church at Antioch fasted, and they seemed to fast when they wanted specific guidance from the Holy Spirit, didn't they? They also engaged in worship, Bible study, and prayer. And we all need to do that on a regular basis. And I just want to pose a few questions when we think about worship, Bible study, and prayer. Um, and they're questions just as much for me as they are for you. Do we frequently come before God in adoration, thanksgiving, and praise? Do we frequently worship God? Are we aware of his presence and thank you for his presence throughout the day? Do we practice the presence of God through the day? For prayer, do we often have times of sustained prayer? And do we also pray on the move? Do we put up those little arrow prayers for people that we meet 
Lord, give me an opportunity to talk about you. Lord, help that person there. Do we also pray on the move and just remember that God is wanting us to be talking with him? Do we often read scripture and marvel at our God who saved Daniel from the lion's den? Who through Esther saved the Jewish race from extinction and loved us so much that he sent his son to pay the price for our sins so that he may offer us eternity in his wonderful presence. Do we meditate on scripture? Um, I'm not very good at doing this, I've got to admit. Do we memorise scripture and then remember those scriptures as we go around during the day? Scriptures that tell us how wonderful God is. Do we do all these things together in community? I know that's quite difficult at the moment, but we do have some opportunities, as well as on our own. Do we encourage one another in these things? Do we minister to one another? So my question for all of us today is, are we a church where everyone is encouraged to use the gifts that God has given them? Are we a church that is missional, that is always looking for opportunities to tell other people about the Lord? Are we a church whose foundation is coming close to God? And as we consider this, um, I'd like to end with the words of Jesus in Matthew 22. Because I think this kind of really sums it up. He summed up the Ten Commandments this way and sums up our mission. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbour as yourself. And this is what it means to be a Christian and be part of the church. And as we consider those things, as we consider the gifts the Holy Spirit has given us, how we encourage other people in those gifts, opportunities for talking to other people about the Lord, and our own, our own life with God in terms of worship, in terms of, in terms of worship, in terms of prayer, and in terms of scripture reading. Should we just have a few minutes just to reflect? Father, these times have been difficult in so many ways. But I thank you that um, you are a rock and you are a refuge. Lord, help us to use this time to draw closer to you and to seek you as to how you wish us to serve you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Brenda. Julie is going to come and lead us in our prayers. If you're anything like me, sometimes... 
I secretly wonder whether my little prayers can actually make any difference in the face of the vast and intractable problems of this world, like a relative who is entirely resistant to the gospel or a terminal diagnosis, a government that is oppressing its citizens or a natural disaster. Our whispered prayers may seem feeble, foolish and futile against the sheer scale of life's troubles. And yet the Bible teaches us that our prayers are vastly powerful. As I was preparing to, to pray this morning, the Lord gave me a picture of a pebble being thrown into a pond. It made a fruity kaplunk as it hit the water and made splashes hit things as it rippled. As more people joined in the pebble throwing, the splashes had far more reaching effects. And I felt God saying, you see, the more people praying, the greater the effect of the prayers. I was just challenged as Brenda spoke that all those big things that she was talking about, we can make a difference to if we come to our Lord in prayer. So I urge you this morning to be encouraged I'm not doing the prayers this morning, I'm simply leading them. And I urge you to make your own prayers in the times of stillness. So, in the power of the Spirit and in union with Christ, let us pray to the Father. Abba Father, thank you for the evidence of your love for us. We offer you our sacrifice of praise this morning by praying verses 1, 3, 7 and 9 of Psalm 8. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place. I consider all flocks and herds and the animals of the wild, the birds in the sky and the fish in the sea. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. In the stillness now, continue your own worship of our Heavenly Father. Abba Father, we know that you know us better than we know ourselves. And we come before you humbly, confessing the sins that we have committed in thought and word and deed. We are really sorry and ask Holy Spirit that you would search our hearts and help us to accept your forgiveness. In the stillness now, continue to make your own prayers to the Lord. Abba Father, we thank you for all you have done and provided for us. Each day you bless us. And right now we thank you, Lord, for the beginning of the harvest season and the wonderful weather we have been experiencing, the vibrant colours of nature around us as we drive through our beautiful Epping Forest, and especially for our food, families and friendships. In the stillness now, Continue to bring to the Lord your own thankful heart. Abba Father, in your word you tell us not to be anxious about anything but to bring everything to you in prayer. We bring to you the issues of the world we live in, of coronavirus, homelessness, war-torn lands, religious persecution, people living as refugees, political unrest, 
loss of loved ones, and many more circumstances. We pray that you would help us to be responsible in our own approach, and also that you would give clarity and wisdom to our leaders. We pray also for our scientists and healthcare professionals as they work so hard to find us a solution to living with coronavirus. In the stillness now, continue to bring to God any particular issues that are on your own heart. Father, we bring to you our church family, and especially Malcolm, Hugh and Steve, as they work so hard to lead us through unprecedented times. And finally, Lord, we ask for the health and well-being of our own families and friends. We pray to know what it is you want of each of us to do, and we pray for an ear to hear the answer and courage to carry out, carry out your will. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Thank you, Julie. Uh, can I invite you all to stand? we come to the close of our service we um, uh, as usual at this point we won't be milling around and sharing the peace with one another but we take this time to recognize that Christ's peace is with us Ooh. it's just a little entertainment for you and um, Christ's peace is with us he can he comes amongst us and speaks his peace to each and every one of us and by his blood we have Peace with one another and peace with God. So, Christ is our peace. He has reconciled us to God in one body by the cross. We meet in his name and we share his peace. So the peace of the Lord be always with you and also with you. Great. Feel free to take a seat. I just wanted to close with the words of Psalm 9. The psalmist says, I will give thanks to you, Lord, with all my heart. I will tell of all your wonderful deeds. I will be glad and rejoice in you. I will sing the praises of your name, O Most High. The Lord reigns forever. He has established his throne for judgment. He rules the world in righteousness and judges the peoples with equity. The Lord is a refuge for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. Those who know your name trust in you, for you, Lord, have never forsaken those who seek you. This is the Lord who we worship. This is the Lord that we follow and we proclaim amongst the world. So let's say the grace together. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forever. Amen. So may the God of hope fill us with all joy and peace in believing through the power of the Holy Spirit and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. So go in peace to love and serve the Lord. 
in the name of Christ. Amen.